Y'all doing all right? Yeah. I think I'm going to change my name to Sparkly, too. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I tried. Don't be a hater now. <laughs> so who stayed up for the New Year's? Anybody? All right. Good for y'all. At 1130, I was going, would somebody please stop blowing up fireworks? I want to go to bed. So I, I know I've hit that place in my life to where I'm ready to go on to bed and just... It just go ahead and pass up the festivities because we only get one local channel, and Lord have mercy, if that was music, I, I'm struggling really badly. So just, just my thoughts, my opinions. But 2016 is a brand new year. We are here for a brand new day. And so, uh, I mean, 2017, 2016, God, see there? It, I did see something where it said, you know, you're going to struggle this whole year because you're going to constantly write the six and then have to write the seven over it because I just finally got to the 16 right. So uh, so now 2017 is a brand new year, and thank God it is because this past year was uh, an interesting one, to say the least. But it's a brand new year. So how many weeks out of this year do you have? 52, okay. So how many days do you have? 365. Anybody know how many hours you have? 8,760, according to the internet, because I looked it up, so that was the best I could do. So, and the internet's always true, right? So, 8,760. 8, My brain has already quit working. 8,760. So, how much time does the person beside of you have? The same. To your left? Same to your right, the same. So we all have the same amount of time throughout this year. We all have the same amount of hours in a day. And so in my mind and in my, my thought process, we always, you know, it's always you talk to somebody, how are you? Well, I'm just so busy. I just don't have time. And then you see somebody else and they're doing twice as much or maybe they're accomplishing twice as many things. And you're going, well, how do they have so much time? How are they able to do all this? I wish I had that much time. Well, they have the same amount of time that you have. But the problem is, is that possibly they are using their time more wisely than you're using yours. Maybe, maybe there's things in your life that you could lay down or maybe even some things you could put aside that, Maybe you're holding you back or keeping you from accomplishing all the things that God has planned for you. So, brand new year, what's the first thing we want to do? Make what? Resolutions. I'm going to lose some weight somewhere, you know. I'm going to lose some weight or maybe I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, start exercising or maybe I'm going to do this or maybe I'm going to do that or maybe I'm going to quit smoking or maybe I'm going to do these things. And so we have all these ideas, these resolutions we want to accomplish. Did you know that 92% of people who say that their goals and resolutions they set for themselves every year never get achieved? 92%. So how many of you actually accomplished a resolution you had this year? Sweet. Hey, there you go. But 92% of people. So when we do that, when we set these ideas, we set these goals for ourselves. We want to get somewhere. We want to be somewhere a lot of times than where we are. What happens? It causes stress. It causes us so much stress. We, oh, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not exercising. We sit around and we fix a meal and then we're like, oh, we got to quit eating bread. Oh, there's just too much bread. And then, then Heather will say, well, what do you want for supper? And I'll say, a sandwich. And then she'll say, but that's more bread, you know. So I love bread. So we're going to eat a lot of bread. So the takeaway this morning, if I could give you one resolution, just one, just one thing that could change every part of your life. So hopefully by the end I can tie all this together that there's one thing that could change every part of your life. So the American Psychology Association did a 2015 Stress in America study. 76% of people were worried about what? Money. 65% were worried about what? Work. 54% were worried about a family responsibility. 51% were worried about their own personal health. 50% are worried about family health problems. And 50% were worried about the economy. The Bible says, and if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 6, because we're going to kind of remain there a little bit. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. 
I want to read a verse for you right there, verse 27. And it says this, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? No. So Jesus said, can all your worries add? So you're worried about money, and you're worried about work, and you're worried about family, and you're worried about health, and you're worried about your own health, and you're worried about the economy, and you're worried about what's on the news, and you're worried about who's president, and you're worried about everything. And Jesus said, can these worries add a single day? How many days you got? 365. Are you going to have 366? Only if it's a leap year. And that's by, by design that we all get that one. So you don't gain another day. You don't gain another hour of life by stressing and worrying and, and, and trying to become something. We say we desire a stress-free life, but you know what happens? We end up with the if-onlys. How many times have you said, well, I could do that if only I had. If I had what they had, I'd be happy. If I had what they had, I would be okay. If, if I had the things that they had, if I was doing the things that they were doing, boy, if, if I had that car, if I had that vehicle, if I had their home, if I had their money, boy, you got some money. Boy, if I had your money, you know what I'd do? Yeah, you go to work every day because that person that you're envying and desiring is probably working their hind end off to be able to have that kind of money. So the problem is, is that we begin to, with all these if onlys, if onlys, if onlys. Look, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21 says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Let me read that one again. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So wherever your treasure is, if you're building up wealth and you're trying to create things for yourself and yet you're never designing or desiring or seeking after a relationship with Christ, if you're never putting that together, then what you're going to end up is you're going to end up empty. Because so many times you can read it over and over. And this past year, God bless, I, I feel bad that we lost all these celebrities. But a celebrity doesn't change my life. And the thing about it is a lot of these celebrities are lonely and broken people because they accomplish so much in life, but they miss the most important thing. And so what happens is we get to that same place. It's another, if only, if only I was a celebrity, if only I was making that kind of money, if only I was riding a tour bus, if only I was singing in stadiums, if only I. And yet so many of these people have missed the very thing, the most important thing, where your treasure is. There the desires of your heart will be also. Heather and I read a lot about being minimalist, and, and that's something that we have subscribed to. It's not a cult, just so you know. But it's, uh, it's about living life with less. It's about, it's about focusing and refocusing life on the things that are most important to you. And, and that looks different for every person. But Joshua Becker, he writes a blog called Becoming Minimalist, and this is something he wrote on there. It says, saying you want something is one thing, and doing something about it is very different. We prove what we desire most by our actions, not by our words. So let me ask you, what is it you want most? What life change do you desire? Then ask yourself this follow-up question. Are you taking the steps necessary to accomplish that goal? Or are you settling for something else instead? After, a, after all, a goal without a plan is just wistful thinking. So if you have a goal in mind, oh, I want to do this. Oh, I want to be this. But you never desire, never try to set aside a plan. And a lot of times we live life just flippantly. We never really plan out what, what we want to do or what we want to see God do in our lives or, or where we believe God wants us to do. We, we never seem to search for that purpose that God may have for our lives. And so we don't make a plan. But you know what? God often speaks of plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, we, we reference that a lot. I know the plans I have for you. 
everything that God does is not without design and is not without planning. So if God, if God has planned out your life, don't you think it's worthwhile for you to seek after what God wants to do in you? Don't you think it's worth your while to say, hey, I need a plan? Because most of us don't have a plan. That's why we spend a lot of time in, in all this stress and worry. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. This is what Jesus was saying. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then in verse 21, he said this, Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So he wasn't saying being wealthy was wrong, but if that's what you denote yourself to, if that's what you spend your time doing, if that's where you want to be, is you want to be consumed with becoming something without allowing God to create that relationship between you and him and create a purpose in your life for what he wants to do for you and what he wants to do in you. We all want the brass ring, but we don't want to take the journey that gets there. And so many times you can look throughout Scripture and we go, well, I don't know if I want that kind of Christianity. I don't know if I want the Paul Christianity where he was on ships and where he was in prison and where he was in, in jail. I don't know that I want that kind. I, I like the good, easy Christianity where we live in a Christian nation and we, we have Christian people in power. You know what? I don't know who's a Christian and who's not except by their fruits. I don't know who's a believer and who's not except by how they live their lives and by what they profess a lot of times can just be words. But if you're not living that truth out, if you're not accomplishing that, there's not a politician alive today that will change your life. But Jesus Christ will change your life. And until we get away from wanting government to do what we need to do and, and focus on what Jesus has called us to do, then we'll never have that rich relationship. We need to focus on that rich relationship. You know what? We look for divine revelation rather than having a practical relationship with Christ. We look for divine. We want, oh, Lord, Lord, I, Lord, help me thought about this this morning as I read over that. I know a lot of you have heard this joke before, but I'm going to tell it anyway. There was a man, and he was in his house, and the floodwaters came. So he climbed up on the roof. The floodwaters were rising and rising, and his neighbor came by in a canoe. And he said, hey, come on, the floodwaters are rising. You can go with me. And he said, no, 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 I am praying, and the Lord is going to save me. The Lord's going to take care. He is going to save me. So he paddled on. Well, the floodwaters got a little bit more, and the police boat came by, and the police said, come on, the floodwaters are rising. You're going to drown. Come with us. He said, no, 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 I am praying the Lord is going to deliver me. The Lord is going to take care of me. So they went on. Finally, he was kind of on his, the tip top of his rooftop, and the National Guard helicopter came by, and they flew by, and they dropped down the ladder. They said, climb on, or you're going to drown. Oh, no. No, I'm good. The Lord is going to save me. The Lord's going to save me. Well, the guy drowned. And he gets to heaven, and he, he says, I want an audience with the Lord. I want to talk to God. And so he went to God, and he said, God, I don't understand. I prayed and prayed and prayed and expected you to deliver me, and you didn't do a thing. And he said, I sent you a canoe and a boat and a helicopter, and you didn't get in. And that's where we are. We're praying for that divine revelation without looking for a practical thing that God is doing right around us. We want God to speak oftentimes in some kind of great, fantastic way so that we can be like, oh, look what the Lord, oh, yes. But you know what? God wants to be a personal Savior. And in being a personal Savior, he wants to work in your heart. And so maybe it's that kind word by somebody you work with. Maybe it's that moment that you share that kind word with somebody and you're able to be that minister of God's grace and love to someone. But the thing is, is that we're, we're so caught up in this divine revelation, we, we miss that practical relationship. But you need and I need to take responsibility for what is ours to do and allow God to fill in the blanks. 
God gave us a mind to think with, a heart to believe with. And yet we want to pass over that a lot of times. We, we want to pass that by. God created you for a purpose. And he created you to use your life in such a way that it would bring honor and glory to his kingdom. God calls to all of us. So we were originally created as human beings. And we were created. I didn't climb up out of an ocean. I was created by God's grace. And so when God created us, he created us with a purpose in mind and and. And because of that broken relationship, Jesus came and died, and he, he repaired that relationship. But I have to accept that. I have to believe that Jesus died for me. I have to believe that Jesus rose again. I have to believe that Jesus is real and that God can change my life. And when I do that, that connects me and God back together. Not by anything I've done, only by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so what happens then is we, we then can have a relationship with God. In 2016, nobody took any responsibility. You could watch the news every day. That wasn't my fault. That wasn't me. I, I, I didn't do it. So let's go back to that first slide, Tony. Stress in America. So money. What's your responsibility? Well, why don't you budget? said the B word, budget. We don't want to do that. We want to spend all we've got and expect God to give us more. Well, God didn't design it that way. God designed a purpose and a plan. Maybe we learned to live below our means and we learned to, you know, there's the 10, 10, 80. You, you give 10%, you save 10% and you try to live on the 80%. And maybe you've already got yourself in such a pickle that you can't get out of it. And you're like, oh my gosh, we're spending everything we have. Well, the goal is to take responsibility and to do what's necessary to get yourself back to where you're not living moment to moment, paycheck to paycheck, because you're only one tragedy away from everything falling apart. And when that happens, when we don't take responsibility and we allow our lives to become into that mess, a lot of times what happens is first thing we want to do, God, why did you let this happen to me? Well, I don't know. It's just like I sent you the canoe, the boat, and the helicopter. I sent you warning signs. If you're signing your paycheck and by tomorrow you have no money left, there's a problem. So you need to address that. Or maybe it's work. Maybe you're stressed over work. Maybe you hate your job. We'll find things about your job you do like. If not, find another job. But seek after the purposes. God designed us this way. And God designed for you to be productive. If it's family responsibility, this is a big one. If you're a husband, be a husband. If you're a wife, be a wife. Don't be somebody else's husband. Don't be somebody else's wife. Be a husband or be a wife. If you're a father, be a father. Take responsibility. If you're a mother, be a mother. If you are willing to do everything that it takes to have a child, then be a parent to that child. If you're a child, be a good one. That's right. Let me get another amen on that one. Amen. If you're a child, be a good one. You can explore life without having to screw it all up. And God put a head on your shoulders, teenagers. Use it sometimes for something other than to lay on the pillow at night. Think about the consequences of the decisions you're making. That's the problem is nobody wants to face consequences. I believe that, and I'm going down this road, I believe that abortion was created because nobody wanted to accept responsibility for the consequences of their choices. And so people are killing babies at an alarming rate so we can do whatever we want to do. And that's the world that we live in. And when we as Christians begin to subscribe or sus subscribe to that same thought, then we create that for ourselves. Personal health. Hey, do a little exercise. Thought about this this morning. 
even if you don't, just the small things. Take the steps instead of the elevator. I always park at the end of the parking lot, which drives my wife insane because she said, there's all these parking spaces. But that's an exercise time for me. We can walk from here to the store and get a little exercise in. And what's really funny, and I thought about this this morning, which she didn't know, but when I was in high school, I used to leave early for school so I could park all the way at the end of the parking lot and then walk in because, uh, you know, when you're in high school, I got my super bad car. I'm going to park way out here so nobody hits the doors, you know. Now it doesn't matter. You know, you used to think, well, if I park beside somebody in a really nice car, they won't hit my vehicle. Nah, they don't care, you know. But the thing is, is that find ways to exercise. God wants you to be healthy. You know, when, when, we, when we create unhealthiness for ourselves, whether it's physically or mentally, that's not what God designed us to be. Family health problems, plan for that. We are all getting older. Your parents are getting older. I'm getting old. Plan for the future. The economy, prepare for that. There's no way that we can, you know, do everything. I guess you can buy gold. That's what they keep telling you to do. But I think only the gold people are making money off of that, just so you'll know. But there's no way to plan for everything. But Jesus said, can all the worries add a single moment to your life? Can every worry create a problem? So listen to this. We must start somewhere. If you never start the race, you'll never achieve the reward. Paul talked about that in 2 Timothy. And it says this, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Paul ran the race. Are you sitting on the sidelines? Are you waiting for somebody else to do it? Do you not volunteer in church because you're waiting for somebody? Oh, I just, I can't do that. God told me not to do it. You know what? God told you to love other people, to love people like yourself. And we were created to be ministers of Christ. Matthew 6, verse 31 and 34, and this is, this is right here at the last. This is what I want you to see. Beginning at verse 31, it says, So don't worry about these things, saying what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear. These things, listen to this, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God. What's that say? Above all else. And live righteously. And he will give you everything you what? Everything, not everything you want, everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. We have enough things going on today, and there's no promise that you'll live tomorrow. So here's the thing. Number one, think of this. What we treasure most controls us. What we treasure most controls controls us. Number two, we have confused want with need. We have confused want with need. And so a lot of times when God blesses us, when God gives us something, we have a hard time processing it because it's not what we want, but it's what we need. Number three, prioritize eternal things not temporary things. Prioritize eternal things, not temporary things. So I'm going to give you your resolution, your one resolution. I'm going to change everything about your life this year. Seek the kingdom of God, what? Above all else. Read that with me again. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. When you develop and, and go after God and seek his purpose for your life, then you begin to see God do great things in your life. 
And it's not always some kind of trumpets blowing. Da, 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 here's the Lord and he's brought it in. Yeah, woo! Yeah, God. There are moments like that. But those are few and far between. Because God doesn't work that way. God works in the still, small voice. God works in the touch of the hand. God works through you to love other people. God works through me to love other people. When you're willing to give, maybe God says, give $5 to this person, and you give that person $5. You don't know their need, and you don't always have to know their need, but what you do know is that God used you to do something that only he knows about because he has a plan and a purpose, and if God has a plan and a purpose, then we need to seek after that plan and that purpose with every part of who we are. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Because when we do that, when we focus in in that way, when we seek after God in that way, and we say, you know what, God? Whether I have wealth or I don't, whether I have great things or whether not, whether my life is known by all or just by my family, God has used my life. And I have done what you've put me here to do. And I have accomplished the work you've put me here. And maybe you're here and you're not even a Christian. You're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I just showed up because I didn't know where else to go today. God has a plan and a purpose for you. He wants to change your life just as well. But you have to let go of who you are and allow him to take control. We're going to pray right now. We're going to have just a time of invitation. I want you to feel free to come forward and, and pray. If you're not a Christian, somebody will meet you right over here to my right, to your left, and speak with you about Christ. But let's stand together. We're going to pray, and then we're going to have just a short invitation. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for how you've blessed us. I pray that, God, you will be glorified and lifted up through everything today. And for those who don't know you, I pray that, God, they may just come to accept you as their Savior. The Lord is so simple and easy in how you've blessed us. So, Father, I just pray for them right in this moment. God, as we just play through this song, God, for those who may come and just need to pray, maybe just make that resolution. God, not to make any other resolution, but to say, Jesus, I want to seek the kingdom of God above all else. Help me to do that. Help me to glorify you and to praise your name and lift you up in all that I'm going to do today. And I just want to praise you.